my, my intention today, my, my wish for you is to walk out of here with uh, some tools, some insights, and ideally some inspiration that will help you on your leadership journey wherever you find yourself in your organisation. <coughs> That's my goal. And what I'm going to draw on is really the last 12, 15 years of uh, my experience, which has really um, been as a researcher, as a consultant, and as a leader of my own business, all in this space that we call transformation. Now, by transformation, I mean how ordinary leaders, ordinary teams, and ordinary organisations become extraordinary. Okay, so that's where I'm going to be, be drawing. And there's really two insights that I want to share with you today that, I'll, that I'm going to build this talk around uh, in order to achieve those outcomes. The first one is this idea. Leadership is a mindset, not a position. Leadership is a mindset, not a position. We've already heard uh, quite a bit of that from Gail and from the panel, a uh, very inspirational panel this morning, and I know Amanda will talk about this when she talks about the craft story. But let me, let me make my point, okay? Everybody knows who this guy is, Gandhi, right? So he's a, a lawyer in a first-class train carriage in South Africa, gets thrown off the train for racial issues, and while he's lying there, uh, humiliated on the platform, uh, has a vision which ends up bringing down the British Empire. Never held a formal position of authority in his life. How many of you, by a show of hands, would consider him to be a leader? Yeah, most people do. For those of you who think you're too old, Mother Teresa started her fundraising activities at 53 years old. Founded an order with no money that expanded all around the globe. Uh, in 1979, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. How many of you would consider her a leader? Yeah. Anybody know who this is? Guess? It's Rosa Parks. Exactly. So Rosa Parks is a seamstress in Mississippi, Alabama, 1955. Refuses to give up her seat, which was the law, to a, a, a white male passenger. Okay, gets persecuted. That initiates a bus boycott, which eventually initiates the civil rights movement. In 1996, she's awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. How many of you would consider her a leader? Okay. What about this guy? By a show of hands, how many would consider him a leader? <laughs> Interesting, right? So at one point, the most powerful individual in the world, yet we struggle, many of us, to raise our hand. This is a guy who had his finger on the button. We don't even give my grandfather the remote control. <laughs> right? And so, key message, leadership is a mindset, not a position. I said there were two. The second one. Your leadership effectiveness is not a matter of your intention. It's a matter of your impact. Your leadership effectiveness is not a matter of your intention, your noble intention. It's a matter of your impact. Why do I say that? Because every leader I have ever met has noble intentions. This may shock you all, but I have not met the leader who aspires to destroy shareholder value, irritate customers, and alienate staff. We generally have noble intentions. But through our research, and when we look at the data on this particular topic, we find quite a big um, statistical gap. So if I was to ask you in this room, as, as I, we have done, my company's done on uh, four or five different continents, ideally, ideally, how would you like to motivate and encourage those you lead to behave? Ideally. What you would typically tell me, and we have this in hard data, tens of thousands of leaders, they will say things like, I want to motivate and encourage my team and those around me uh, to achieve worthy goals. To set and achieve worthy goals. Sound good? Yeah. Second, um, I would like um, to motivate and encourage my team to be innovative and creative and bring their whole self to work, what Maslow calls self-actualization. Sound good? Yeah. Third one, uh, I would like uh, to motivate and encourage my people to develop themselves, to be their best self and to develop those around them. And finally, I would like to motivate and encourage my people to build high quality, high trusting relationships, work collaboratively as a team. Sound like a pretty good vision for leadership, right? Yeah? No matter whether we do that in India, in England, in Australia, in China, in Germany, in North America, 
people plus or minus 5% have pretty much the same picture, statistically speaking. When we actually assess what, how they actually motivate and encourage others to behave, would it surprise you to hear that we find a fairly different picture? Surprise you? On average, what leaders tend to motivate and encourage in others is they motivate and encourage others to depend on them for decisions. Let's wait for Moses to part the waters. They motivate and encourage people to avoid responsibility for fear of getting into trouble, making a mistake. They motivate and encourage others to oppose ideas, even good ones, due to minor flaws, because everything has to be perfect. Or they motivate and encourage people to compete with one another to be noticed or to get the biggest bonus. And so our intention is noble. How we actually motivate and encourage others can be quite uh, different. So that's one piece of data. The second piece of data is even more scary than that. And that is even more fundamental. Two thirds of all leaders are actually unaware of the impact they are having, good or bad. Two thirds. Any idea why? Any idea why? Not asked? They don't ask? Not self-aware? Let, let me tell you a little story which will uh, make the point. Uh, a couple of years back I was doing a speaking engagement um, roughly this size. It was at a leadership conference uh, and there were about 500 leaders in the room basically on the tables of their executive team. So 50 or 60 companies represented on tables of 8 to 10. Uh, it was a leadership conference that went for a couple of days and my talk was to be on this subject, the value of values. What I'd been asked to speak about was how does the soft stuff, the so-called soft stuff, become the hard stuff? And so uh, they were a very senior audience and I was worried they were going to be a little bit cynical. And so I thought I'm going to get them engaged really, really early on. And so this is what happened. I said, look, we're going to start with something really practical. I'm going to choose a value and that value is integrity. Why did I choose that value? Because it's on about 80 to 85% of the Fortune 100 value statements, and same for the ASX. Apparently, everybody wants to have integrity. Okay, so let's choose integrity, and I gave them a definition. My definition of integrity is you do what you say you will. So what I asked them to do, I won't make you do this, but what I asked them to do is I said, look, I'd like you to close your eyes so we don't get any competition, and raise your hand if you agree with this statement that you are a leader of high integrity. 500 people in the room, how many hands went up? 500? Actually, it was about 700 because some people did that, <laughs> right? And I said, open your eyes, have a look around, and they all looked around and they all felt very good about themselves. I said, okay, close your eyes, now comes the more interesting question, put your hands down. How many of you would agree that your fellow executives share your same high level of integrity? What do you think happened this time? about 30% of the hands went up, which made for a very interesting conversation when they opened their eyes. <laughs> the conclusion that they came to, which was the one that I wanted them to come to, was that we judge ourselves by our intentions, we judge everybody else by their actions. I'll say that again. We judge ourselves by our intentions, we judge everybody else by their actions. Uh, there's a term in social psychology for this, it's called illusory superiority. That's why 93% of us believe we're above average drivers. <laughs> and so my obsession, my fascination has been with this gap between our intentions and how we actually lead on a day-to-day -day basis, no matter where we are in the organisation. And why I became fascinated with this and why I decided to undertake doctoral research, and I actually started my doctoral research on the day my daughter was born, which is a pretty cool excuse to leave um, class but it really makes you get very clear on why you're doing this, a growing business and, and a young family um, starting. And the, the, the real reason is I was frustrated. I was really frustrated um, with what I was reading in the management literature. I was reading all these texts about the attributes of these great heroic leaders. Level five leadership, charismatic leadership, authentic leadership, tribal leadership, primal leadership, I even read a book as a homage to my Italian heritage called Leadership Soprano Style. <laughs> and the dilemma for me with this content um, was, was not what it espoused, ideas like vision and courage and integrity and authenticity and all that stuff. It's just that I, in my work, hadn't met the superhero that they were describing. 
the people that I was interacting with uh, in our work were ordinary managers and leaders doing the best they could under ever-increasing pressure. And so what I was looking for and couldn't find was a roadmap for how these ordinary mortals could transform into one of these extraordinary superhero-like figures. Paradoxically, um, in our own business, we were starting to see these stories unfold in some of the companies um, that Gail mentioned earlier on. And so we found ourselves uh, about six, seven or eight years ago with a pool of leaders, CEOs in the, in the first instance, who had measurably transformed their own effectiveness as a leader from very ineffective through the eyes of their key stakeholders to highly effective in the top 5% of effectiveness in a database that has something like a million leaders in it. So quantum transformation, demonstrable, measurable, algorithmic, academically rigorous. They'd also done the same thing with their leadership teams and big coincidence with their organisations on important measures that, that people like us care about, which would be increasing levels of financial performance, increasing levels of customer advocacy, increasing levels of employee commitment, and so on. And so we had leaders who had transformed, quote unquote, and what I wanted to work out was how they did it. And that became my obsession and it became the research. 